In this lecture, we're going to look at um, what it means to actually be a disciple, to define what a disciple of Jesus Christ is, because we can talk all day about, here we want to make disciples, let's go and reproduce that, let's go make, mature, and multiply disciples, but if we actually don't know what a disciple is, and how you become one, and what characterizes one, then uh, we can fall into a trap of making something that is, actually isn't what Christ had intended. So in this lecture, we're going to look at three key questions. One is, we're going to look at, the, look at the question, what is a disciple of Christ? Second one is, how does one become a disciple of Christ? And third, what are the characteristics of a disciple of Christ? Now, uh, each of these could be a book by themselves, and they are. Um, each of these could be uh, multiple classes and lectures by themselves, and they are in many other places. But today, uh, for the purpose of this course, we're going to try to just give, really give a short synopsis for each of these and give uh, just a lot of scriptural foundations for where to find your own answers uh, as you search scripture to find out the answers to these questions. So first, what is a disciple of Christ? Well, Francis Chan in, in the book Multiply that uh, you'll be using in this class to uh, work with another person or a group to disciple them, he says the word disciple refers to a student or apprentice. Disciples in Jesus' day would follow their rabbi, which means teacher, wherever he went, learning from the rabbi's teaching and being trained to do as the rabbi did. Basically, a disciple is a follower, but only if we take the term follower literally. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is as simple as obeying his call to follow. And so, uh, in our modern day, we don't quite understand the concept of a disciple with a, uh, a rabbi. Uh, but, as we see in the example that Jesus set with his 12 disciples, they literally followed him around everywhere he went. They watched how he ate. They watched how he interacted with strangers. They watched how he healed people. They watched how he taught. All these things they did by simply following him. Now, we're in a unique situation because we don't have Jesus physically here for us to follow. And we don't want to say, follow pastor so-and-so or follow this other Christian. We still say, follow Christ. So how do we actually do that? How do we follow Christ uh, when he is not physically here on earth as he was in the days of the disciples? I think understanding from the rest of Scripture what it means to be a disciple of Christ and how he gave us the church, I think that will help us understand that a lot better. So as we start to define and look at what is a disciple of Christ, it's a very important passage of Scripture I think gives us uh, the main clue to what it means to actually define a disciple of Christ. It comes from Matthew 4.19, and this is from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. Um, simply says, uh, it's a familiar verse, Jesus is going to his disciples and he says, Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people, or fishers of men, um, as some other translation says. So here are three elements in this that I think really define what it means to be a disciple for us. And we follow along from left to right. A, a person who is a disciple, they are a follower of Christ. He said, Follow me. They are being transformed by Christ. I will make you, speaking Christ will make us. And then they are on the mission of Christ, fish for people. And we know that the fish for people is not casting a line or a hook or a net into the water and hoping people come out. Uh, it was actually the idea of uh, fishing for people in a spiritual sense, that we are finding those lost people and bringing them, reeling them in, so to speak, uh, to life in Christ. And so uh, this is, uh, I think, the best definition or description of a disciple that I have come across. Uh, this is not uh, something that I uh, necessarily wrote myself, um, but as a follower of Christ, being transformed by Christ, and on the mission of Christ. So I think Matthew 4, 19 is probably the best single verse to define what disciple is. Now, we can look at the rest of Scripture and find out different characteristics with the nature of a disciple, uh, but I think this really gets at the heart of what a disciple is. This question is, how does one become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Uh, what are the steps required for a person to go from not being a disciple to becoming one? I think the narrative of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' life with his disciples, really gives us a clue. So let's simply uh, look at the Bible to see the progression of the 12 disciples with Jesus. Now, um, we just quoted Matthew 4.19, which as you see is actually uh, listed here, the second one. But we first need to look at Matthew 4.17. Now, the previous parts of chapters of Matthew go into his birth and prophecies, visit the Magi and so forth, and then the temptation of Jesus starts in chapter 4. But let's look at the um, latter half, latter part of Matthew 4. <clears throat> Now, uh, let's, start, let's start in verse 12. He had just finished, close that out. 
he had just finished um, uh, dealing with uh, Satan, the, his temptation, and he passed with flying colors. And in verse 12 of Matthew 4, it says, When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. This light is Jesus Christ. In verse 17, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, this is um, basically the same message that John the Baptist had been uh, preaching. And we just saw that he was arrested in verse 12 for preaching the same message. But now Jesus is saying it. It has a little bit more um, weight behind it now because this is Jesus talking about and he is actually the one through whom this can happen. He, they're the one, he is the one that can allow for this repentance who they can actually repent to because he is God. And he says, because the kingdom of heaven has come near, speaking of himself. So then, right immediately, he, he says, he starts beginning this, he, he begins preaching this message, and then, verse 18, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And so, here are the two first steps of the progression. And we see uh, on the, uh, the, the the screen here, the first one is simply repentance. This progression there, he's preaching this message of repentance. So this is the, kind of the first uh, step for someone to become a disciple. We're answering the question, how does one become a disciple of Christ? I think the first step is simple biblical repentance, realizing their need for a Savior, realizing uh, that only God can save them from their sins, um, and repenting and simply placing their faith in Christ. So I believe that is the first. It's the message that Jesus preached. But the second part is the follow part. He called, goes to these two guys and says immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So here, four guys, uh, two, two separate little interactions. Jesus said, hey, follow me. Follow me. It says immediately they left everything that was normal to them. They left their family. They left their jobs. They left everything that was normal to them. And they simply followed Jesus. But I think they were willing to follow him because he they had already heard him preach this message of repentance. The text doesn't say, oh, and those four men were present. But he was in their region and he began preaching this. And I think that they were just kind of waiting for him to come by. I think they may have been intrigued. Maybe several days earlier they heard him preach this message of repentance and it resonated with them. And so they were more willing to follow. Now that's the first two. You repent, then you follow Christ. He says immediately they left everything they started following him. And then we see that they start learning. In chapters 5 through 9, uh, chapter 9, chapter 5 starts with the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes. And then it goes into uh, the, the whole Sermon on the Mount, how to pray, how to, you know, things about divorce and truth and adultery and how to be generous and how to pray, love your enemies, all these things. And then he keeps, uh, do not judge. I'm just reading the headlines uh, from my Bible. Um, how to, the, the, the cure for anxiety. And then in chapter 8, they start seeing Jesus do miracles. He's healing people. He's cleaning, uh, he uh, heals uh, the centurion. He cleanses, cleanses a leper. Um, in verse 9, it's more of forgiving and healing. And then he calls Matthew. And he, he teaches them about fasting and he heals the blind. So here's this learning time where they are watching Jesus do things, but also listening. He's communicating this message, but he's also listening. And throughout the rest of the book of Matthew, Matthew, um, he, he teaches in parables, and he uh, give these, gives these object lessons, and he sits down with the disciples afterward, and actually says, do you understand what this was about? And they said, no, we, we don't, and he sits down, and he explains it to them. So there's this learning time, but notice in chapter 10 uh, of Matthew, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles, and it gives their names. Verse 5, Jesus sent out these 12 uh, these twelve, after giving them instructions, don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles and don't enter a Samaritan town. Be focused instead on Israel. Go to the lost sheep of the house, house of Israel first. As you go, proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. Re proclaim that same message of repentance that he started with. Because that's where your disciple starts from. 
heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons, do everything they just saw him do, right? He just did all these things that he listed. So in that learning part, they're supposed to pay attention and do as he did. Now in, in Matthew 10, he's saying, go and do what I told you to do. Um, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse with leprosy, drive out demons, freely you receive, freely give. Don't acquire gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or staff for the work, for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Now, we actually want to go through this passage from Luke 10, the same passage but in a different uh, gospel. We're going to go through this later in uh, this class a little more in depth. Um, so we're just going to read it through for right now. Verse 12, greet a household when you enter it, and if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it's unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more trouble on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. In essence, he's saying, go to this new place where the gospel really hasn't been established, where repentance is not happening. Proclaim this message of repentance and establish a, a beachhead, establish a group in someone's home find that person of peace find that person who is worthy and say you are now going to be the leader of the gospel here in this town and train them up to repent follow learn and do just as jesus did with the disciples and then we see they come back and then matthew 28 he does more teaching but then in the matthew 28 he tells them to do something else very popular verse that we actually had just looked at in this class Verse 18, this is after his death and resurrection, and now he's getting ready to go back uh, to the Father. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Sound familiar? He says the same thing in the beginning of chapter 10. All authority has been given to me, now I give it to you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember I am with you always to the end of the age. So essentially, to make disciples means go, preach this message of repentance, Teach them how to follow Christ. That's that baptism part is kind of like that public demonstration that I am now following Christ. And then teaching them to obey. That's learning. And the whole thing is wrapped around doing. The whole thing is, the, the, the whole idea is go and make disciples yourself. So even the narrative of the Gospel of Matthew and, and the progression of the 12 disciples uh, gives us, okay, how does one actually become a disciple? I say they repent. They see how to, they learn how to follow Jesus. Oh, they follow Christ. They give their hearts to Him. They follow and live as He lived. They also are learning. They're studying Scripture. They're, they're praying. They are um, learning what it means to be a disciple, learning what it means to obey Christ. And they're also doing. They, they don't just stop. And notice that the disciples, um, they, they repented. They started following. They learned. They started doing in chapter 10. But then they had to go back and start learning some more. And they're still following Him. So you never actually stop. You don't progress from one to the other and stop. Okay, okay, you repent one time, but you never stop following, you never start learning, and you never start doing. It's kind of like this cycle of following, learning, and doing. So are all, are, are all steps required to become a disciple? This is a key question, because we the question is not, are all these required for salvation or to become a Christian? I would contend that a disciple equals a Christian but we have to be very careful here because what can what can happen is we can say, here is what it means to be a disciple. Here's how you become one. And we can just be content with letting someone just stop at repentance. Well, grace says repentance is all that is required for our salvation. So becoming a disciple and following Christ and, and obeying, these are not requirements for our salvation. It is key to note because if it was, then salvation would be up to us and not up to Christ. Okay, grace is repentance is all that is required for our our salvation. We repent, put all of our faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians two eight and nine. But grace also says obedience is required for our sanctification. So the idea of a disciple is one who has been spiritually transformed by Christ and is being transformed by uh, Christ as well. That is sanctification. It's salvation and it is sanctification. So. Grace says repentance is all that's required for our salvation, but it also says that obedience is required for our sanctification. So as someone repents and they follow and they learn and they do, that 
following, learning, and doing is all part of our sanctification, not our salvation. But to be a holistic disciple who is honoring Christ and is being fruitful, as the rest of what Jesus taught his disciples to do, says that I think we also need to make sure that we are doing our part of being obedient for the sake of our sanctification or our spiritual growth into Christ-likeness. What characterizes a disciple of Christ? Well, this is, comes from the a book called Gospel Centered Discipleship by uh, Jonathan Dotson. Uh, it's a great little book. It actually used to be the required textbook that I used to use in this class, and instead now I just kind of pull from it uh, for many of the lectures. Um, but they say a disciple, uh, what characterizes a disciple is three things, that they are rational, uh, that they are a learner. Okay, we just, we just actually you know, looked at that. They are always learning more about what it means to follow Christ. They're relational. They're part of a gospel family, right? They're part of the community of the church, and they are investing relationally with others. And they're missional. They are living life as a missionary. I would say, just as I said, a, a disciple equals Christian, and I would say that Christian equals missionary, okay? So all, to me, those three words are pretty much synonymous. Disciple, Christian, missionary. We should all be living as missionaries no matter where we are. Even if you're, uh, you know, uh, we think that uh, missionaries are the church planters and those going overseas doing you know, different kinds of cross-cultural um, um, gospel work. Well, cross uh, mission and being a missionary, um, you can cross a, a continent or cross a larger body of water, cross to another culture, or you can just cross the threshold of your own front door and be a missionary and look out at your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers and so forth. So I would say that a disciple is a missionary, but uh, I, I like how gospel-centered discipleship, but in the book they go through a lot more in depth. I would highly recommend it. It's called Gospel-Centered Discipleship by Jonathan Dotson. Um, they say it's a relational, I mean they're rational, relational, and disciple is missional. Dr. Rob Gallaty, um, who is a pastor in Tennessee, he's outlined five marks of a disciple, and he and his church um, has started a thing called Replicate Ministries. Um, you can, I think it's replicate.org. I'm not exactly sure the website, but if you Google Replicate Ministries by uh, Dr. Robbie Gallaty, uh, you find a lot of great resources. He's written several books on what it means to become a disciple, to grow as a disciple, make disciples. He's really big into, into discipleship. Uh, we can almost use all of his books in this course. You know, no lectures, just read his books. They're really phenomenal. I have about half of what he's written. Um, but there are, there are five marks that he says kind of characterizes a disciple. And this is really used for even evaluating whether someone is living as a disciple. Because we, so we, this is the, the epidemic of North America is that we have led people to repent and believe, but we have not led them to replicate that into the lives of others. We have not led them to be uh, in their sanctification to grow in Christ. We have said, just keep learning but not actually doing. And so uh, this this can actually be used to evaluate if a person actually is living as a disciple as they say they are. Here are the five things, the five marks or characteristics of a disciple. They're missional, accountable, reproducible, communal, and scriptural. Now, these are very similar to what the three that we just looked at before from Gospel Center Discipleship, but these are a little bit more uh, robust, and I want us to go through these a little bit more uh, in depth. First of all, a disciple is missional. They are living out the implications of the gospel in their homes, workplace, and in their community. They are living a life on mission. They are taking to heart the command to be witnesses of the gospel from Acts 1-8. They are both demonstrating and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are living as a missionary anywhere that God puts them with whomever God places them with. So a disciple is missional, living a life on mission. They're also accountable. They're willing to open up their lives, the good bad, the good side of their lives and the bad side, the, the success and the wins and the, the things to, to cheer about, but also those sins and struggles and, and, and pitfalls that we find ourselves. They're willing to open their lives, the good and the bad, to other believers, both in large groups and in small groups to ensure they are growing into the likeness of Christ. We're going to talk a little bit more in future lectures about some of these groups where accountability can happen, uh, discipleship groups or even community groups or missional communities, there's smaller groups, Sunday school classes where uh, these type of, uh, this type of accountability environment can actually be fostered. We're going to talk about those in a later lecture. But the, the simple fact is, are we willing as a disciple to open up our lives to other people, to be honest about our failures, honest about our sin, and actually say, will you pray for me? Will you help me battle this sin? Will you help me find repentance and forgiveness? Will you help me learn how to forgive my spouse or forgive my father or mother who wronged me? 
And will you help me in seeking forgiveness for the wrong that I've done? An accountable disciple also gives themselves for the sake of others by doing the one another passages of Scripture. I think there's 31 or 32 one another passages in Scripture. And by looking at these, it's, they're all throughout um, um, uh, the, uh, the New Testament, but it's, you know, love one another, do this for one another, bear one another's burdens, all these one another's that we're supposed to do together to help. And accountability is not just, are you sinning? Are you looking at something you shouldn't do? Are you thinking something? You know, we, th we think accountability is that, but accountability is saying, hey, how are, you, how are you doing in sharing your faith? How are you doing in reading the, script, uh, reading the Bible? Are you keeping your family accountable? Are you being a good spiritual leader um, of your household? All those things go into actually looking at what it means to be an accountable disciple. But a disciple is also reproducible. They're willing to replicate what God has done in their heart and lives into other people to make more disciples. This is key. This is a statement in blue. Jot it down. It is very, very, very important. Discipleship is not complete until the disciple becomes a discipler. Now I would really say that discipleship is never complete, but you can't even near completion if you don't see that the person who is being discipled becomes a discipler of other people. That is when we're starting to see that sanctification happen, that, that spiritual growth progresses, when that disciple doesn't just remain content, just soaking up things like a sponge, but is really be wrung out into the life of another person by reproducing the gospel into someone else. They take heart the great commission to make disciples of all nations from Matthew 28. A disciple is communal, views their baptism as joining the global church family as well as a local church family. I believe and value the local church, no matter the expression, whether it's a house church or a mega church. I don't care. I love the local church, but I also love the global church. So we are, as a Christians and disciples, we are in this big global community where we can work together with churches and believers from all across the world to see uh, the gospel spread and the Great Commission realized. But we also need to value that we need to be part of a local church family. And the local church family is also really good, I think, to be part of even a smaller group inside that local church family. You know, if you're in a church of one, two, three, four hundred people, or, or even more, it's very easy to get lost and just become a pew sitter. And you have no one keeping you accountable, no one seeing if you're living on mission, no one who is helping you be reproducible if you're not living communally. So I think this can take on many different ways. Some churches use Sunday school to kind of build that communal aspect. Some, like ours, do more of a missional community approach. Some do small groups. There's all kinds of different ways of doing it. And we'll talk about many of those ways of having groups inside of uh, this class. But they also realize that the Christian life was not meant to be lived in isolation. Jesus had his 12. And he did all of life and ministry with him his last three, three and a half years or so. And he modeled that for them. And what do we see in the book of Acts? They do the same thing. They build small communities in all these cities across the known world. A communal disciple joyfully participates in the life of the church as seen as Acts 2, 42 to 47, where they're in each other's home, they're breaking bread, sharing a meal together, but they're diving into scripture together, and they're loving each other and doing evangelism together. And lastly, a disciple is scriptural. This is last but it's not least. It's probably the last one because it's an S and marks. So you don't want to say this is a smart of a disciple. So anyways, um, but a scriptural disciple views scripture as absolutely vital to living as a follower of Christ and finds gospel nourishment through God's word on a regular basis, daily soaking and immersing yourself in the word of God. They, uh, a scriptural disciple trusts what 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says about the nature and purpose of scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired by God. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, or the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If we really trust what that says about the nature and the purpose of scripture, then we know that it can correct us and rebuke us, but also lovingly guide us and those that we are discipling. So a disciple of Christ is missional, accountable, reproducible, communal, and is scriptural. And I think if we trust that all of these help us understand a, the characteristics or the marks of a disciple of Christ, I think that will help us understand what it means to be 
a disciple of Jesus Christ. So today's uh, lecture, just as a quick recap, we answer the question, what is a disciple? We look at Matthew 4, 19 to answer that. Then we looked at uh, the question, how does one become a disciple? And we said that they repent, they follow, they learn, and they do. And it's almost like this cycle that keeps going through. Follow, learn, and do. You're doing these things all at the same time um, in balance. And then we also say, well, what's the characteristics of a disciple? How do we how do we know a disciple when we see one? How can we look at someone's life and say, nah, that person's a disciple? But I think that comes from those marks of a disciple, from the, what we saw at Gospel Center Discipleship, that they are, um, they are relational. Uh, that they are, gosh, I'm going to forget the other R right now. Um, they are uh, rational, relational, and missional. Sorry. Um, and we also looked at these five marks from Rob Galilee that a disciple is missional, accountable, reproducible, communal, and scriptural. And I hope that these will help us understand and define what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ.